Okay, thank you. Now, oh yeah, all right. Who wants to go first? Thank you, Michael. Thanks for having us. We're happy to be here. We have a PowerPoint, so I'm gonna screen share mine. Oh, I see a host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, I'm sorry. No worries. I'll try it now. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. And if anybody wants a copy of the slides, you have to send me $10. And, <laughs> well, maybe not. All right. Forget that. All right. Go ahead. Sounds good. Yep. Our, our slides are available. Everyone can get a copy. No problem. All right. How's that looking? Great. Okay. Perfect. There we go. All right. So welcome, everyone. We're really happy to be here. Uh, my name is Anna Liu. I'm with my law partner, Olivia Doppler. We are attorneys and partners at a law firm in San Francisco called Stephen Adair McDonald and Partners. We've presented for Michael a couple of times and we're always happy to share our knowledge and the ever <laughs> changing landlord tenant laws throughout California um, and in, in the Bay Area. We are in San Francisco, so our practice mostly focuses in the uh, cities and counties up north, but we do um, today have a presentation that focuses a bit more statewide. Uh, let Olivia go ahead and um, introduce herself first. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Olivia Doppler. I'm a partner at Stephen Adair McDonald and Partners. I've been with the firm for about nine years now, um, and my practice focuses primarily in our firm's unlawful detainer department. So that means I'm focusing primarily on evictions and other landlord-tenant related matters. Um, for example, a handle uh, Ellis Act evictions, owner move-in evictions, and other things in rent-controlled cities. Uh, I also handle cases basically throughout the state of California that are falling under just general California law, like AB 1482, which we'll be discussing today, um, and just other landlord-tenant disputes. So I'll handle things like rent board mediations and arbitrations in cities that have a local rent board, helping landlords increase the rent, and just dealing with other uh, you know disputes and um, issues that come up during the course of a tenancy. And Anna, I'll let you introduce a little bit more about your practice. Thank you. Um, again, I'm Anna. I've been with uh, our firm, Sam Law, for a little over 11 years. We, uh, My practice is similar to Olivia's. I also um, handle some buyer-seller disputes, co-owner disputes like partitions, um, general landlord-tenant matters, both commercial and residential. All right, so let's dive in. Um, Olivia will give us an, a brief overview of what we're here for today and what we're talking about. Yeah, so today we're going to give you kind of an overview on some key issues that landlords in California are facing. Uh, and as Michael noted, uh, this comes up and may um, come up for some of your clients when they're either considering purchasing a property that has tenants in it or if they want to sell a property that has tenants in it. And a lot of the times that's coming up in the context of wanting to get the tenants out so that they can maximize the price that they get for the sale of the property. Um, so some of the things that we're going to cover today include uh, rental agreements, security deposits, probably the most important part of the tenancy, collecting the rent, because this is a business after all. Uh, enforcing lease terms, entering into a tenant's unit, uh, which often comes up in the context of repairs uh, and how to handle those repairs correctly, rent increases, again, terminating the tenancy, some tips on insurance, and we'll give you some comments on compliance and fair housing issues as well. Next slide, please, Anna. Okay, so we're gonna dive in first. Um, and cover some key tips when it comes to rental agreements that all landlords should be aware of. So first and foremost, it's really, really important that landlords have a good rental agreement that's in writing and signed by the parties. Um, we see a lot of situations where landlords are buying properties and maybe the seller lost the rental agreement or they never had one. 
And it can make things really confusing um, and make it difficult for the landlord to enforce terms of a tenancy when there's nothing in writing that actually confirms what those terms are. Um, the Basically, there can be a lot of disputes between a landlord and tenant when there's not something in writing. Um, it's also really, really important that landlords actually get their tenants to sign these agreements as well so that it's enforceable against the tenant. I've seen a fair number of situations where the landlord actually goes through the trouble of preparing the rental agreement, but then they forget to ever have their tenant sign it, or maybe they lost the copy that the tenant signed. Um, so it's also very important that landlords hold on to these things, keep records of them, especially these days in the digital age. Um, landlords should make sure they're keeping a copy electronically and keep the original as well. But if you've got it backed up in multiple forms, there's obviously a better chance that they'll uh, hold on to it and have these records to pull out later. Um, the other really important thing to note here is that we uh, see a lot of landlords that just pull some generic type of rental agreement off the internet. Um, but California has a lot of really specific rules that, that landlords need to comply with. And so that includes things like there are certain disclosures and language that have to be in every California rental agreement. So if you're pulling off some rental agreement from New York or just somewhere else in the country or just something that's more generic that could be used anywhere, uh, it's probably not going to have those specific California requirements. Um, and likewise, there's just particular issues that come up that are unique to California because California has such restrictive rules for landlords. So it, it's really important to have a rental agreement that's tailored to California specifically. And if there is a local uh, rent ordinance that's in place, that it also be tailored specifically to that. So this may mean that the landlord needs to actually get some legal help in reviewing their rental agreement and making sure that they're keeping up with the updates in the law. Um, on a next slide, please. So um, we're going to cover a couple of kind of like what we would consider some of the most common or important lease terms. Um, a good rental agreement is generally going to be at least a dozen or maybe even more pages long. And again, there's certain things that even have to be in there under California law. So we can't get into everything today, but these are some ones that uh, come up either in our practice a lot or that we get asked about a lot. So we want to cover these. Um, so the first one is terms relating to payment of rent. And here it's really, really important that the landlord have a clearly defined rent amount, a clearly defined due date and uh, clear terms on who can pay the rent. And so what do we mean by that? Basically, you know, again, the rent amount itself needs to be clear and that's usually something that landlords cover. Um, but also it should be very clear when the payment is due. Otherwise the landlord may not be able to uh, serve a notice to pay or quit or take other action against the tenant if it's not clear when the tenant needed to make the payment or there could be some significant delay in enacting those rights. Um, the other thing is that it should be clear on who can pay rent. And so a good rental agreement will tell the tenant, for example, that, that if there are multiple roommates in the property that the landlord is only gonna collect one rent payment from everybody. So we don't wanna see situations where the landlord's taking partial payments from several different people who are living in the property that can sometimes even create separate tenancies. So that's really important that the landlord just collect one payment from the tenants for the entire tenancy and a good rental agreement will actually specify that and require it. Um, another, term uh, or set of terms that comes up a lot and that we get asked about a lot relates to subletting and assignment and basically who can occupy the property. Um, so it's important that this be clearly defined in the lease uh, so that the landlord can enforce these rights. For example, saying you know who the allowed occupants are, if there's a restriction on how many people can live in the property. And I think very importantly, pro prohibitions on subletting and assignment, which you know is a basically turning over the tenancy to new people. Um, but landlords should also note that some cities do have limitations on the ability to enforce these terms. So uh, we see kind of similar iterations of this throughout cities with rent control in California. But for example, in San Francisco, there are provisions that say, even if the landlord puts a cap on how many people who can live in the property, for example, the lease says only four people can live there, the tenant can actually bring in more than that. Um, 
and so uh, just so long as the tenant is not going over state or local occupancy limits. So landlords, um, you know, while these terms should be clearly defined in the rental agreement, landlords should also know that some places have restrictions on enforcing these. And so talking to an attorney who knows about these rules is important if you're going to try to enforce these provisions. Um, the Another thing that comes up a lot in our practice is provisions relating to attorney's fees. And so what we mean by that is that a lease may say that if the landlord, for example, wins a lawsuit against the tenant, that the landlord is allowed to recover their attorney's fees from the tenant as the winning party in the lawsuit. Um, however, California law makes this reciprocal, meaning that if the tenant wins, then they can get their attorney's fees back from the landlord. And a lot of the time, this is this is much more beneficial for the tenant than for the landlord, because tenants, you know, if they're renting, they don't probably own property. They don't own the assets for the landlord to actually be able to go after. Um, but on the other hand, the landlord does. So we're, we're seeing um, definitely a, a switch in, in just kind of the prevailing use of these terms and just seeing that these more, more modern lease agreements actually do not have prevailing party attorney's fees. Instead, they provide that each side is going to pay their own attorney's fees, or at least that there's some sort of cap, you know, for example, maybe capping it out at a thousand or two thousand dollars so that the landlord's not left with some huge bill later on in the event something goes wrong during the tenancy. Um, and then another really important lease term is an anti-waiver provision. And basically, this is a provision that's saying that if the landlord chooses not to enforce a particular term in the lease uh, on one instance, that they're not forever waiving the right to enforce that term. And so that's a really, really important one to have in the rental agreement. And I'll go ahead and turn things over now to Anna to discuss security deposits. Thanks, Olivia. Security deposits are probably some of the most commonly asked questions. Um, to me, you know, a lot of the disputes between landlords and tenants come up during the security deposit stage, whether that be um, when the tenant vacates and there's unpaid rent or there's damage beyond normal wear and tear. We get a lot of questions saying, you know, can I deduct for this? Or um, I, you know, didn't return it within 21 days of the tenant leaving, what could happen? So surprisingly, these, these disputes pop up quite a bit. And sometimes these security deposit disputes can blow up into a much bigger uh, problem. So the purpose of this, um, portion or slide is just to give everyone a very quick high level snapshot of security deposits, you know, how can they be used, what law governs them. So California does have a statute on point. It is civil code section 1950.5. A few main points that um, property owners really need to know about deposits is that uh, first state law does not allow non-refundable deposits. And there are limits on how much a property owner can collect at the outset of the tenancy. The limit is no more than two times the monthly rent for an unfurnished unit and three times for a furnished unit. There are some other limitations, like if you have a water bed, you can ask for an extra deposit. Um, there are limits also for military service members, but ge the general rule is no more than two times the monthly rent for an unfurnished unit and three times for a furnished Landlords really should not be collecting separate deposits like a key deposit, a cleaning deposit, or last month's rent. Um, in my view, it's it's better to or best practice to collect one deposit and call it a security deposit. And that way, at the end of the tenancy, when you are potentially as the owner um, deducting for damage beyond normal wear and tear or other permissible deductions under that statute, you can. Whereas if you just collect a deposit for last month's rent, for example, then you can only apply that to last month's rent. Also, um, from our perspective, if there's an eviction, for, an ex for example, if a landlord has collect collected last month's rent, we always have to watch out for that because it triggers a potential problem where um, the short the rule is a landlord cannot accept rent after serving an eviction notice, it waives that notice. So if they've collected last month's rent at the beginning of the tenancy, how does that play in? So we always have to look for that and deal with that if it comes up. Um, there's a statute Olivia will cover a little bit later, but it's civil code section 1947.3, and it essentially allows a third party payor to pay rent or a deposit on behalf of a tenant. 
if um, certain conditions are met. So essentially property owners need to know that if a third party wants to pay the security deposit for a tenant, maybe a parent paying for their child, um, that is allowed under the statute, again, as long as certain conditions are met. Uh, some local ordinances require landlords and owners to pay interest on the deposit annually. San Francisco is one of those cities. Uh, the San Francisco does produce um, a list of the security deposit interest each year and um, the amount that needs to be paid to tenants on that, uh, that deposit. The other general rules are when the tenant vacates, the landlord must provide the security deposit and accounting within 21 days of the tenant vacating the property. What I mean by accounting is if the landlord is going to retain the deposit for any purpose, they have to show what it's for. If they are using it to repair damage beyond normal wear and tear, they have to provide itemized receipts. There are very specific rules regarding this, which we won't get into, but um, the general rule is tw within 21 days, you have to return it or account for it. And um, you can the statute limits what landlords can use the security deposit for. I mentioned unpaid rent and damage beyond normal wear and tear are the main um, permissible deductions. Okay, so next we're going to cover collecting rent. And as I mentioned, this is arguably the most important part of the tenancy or, or having a tenant in a property because this is a business. So landlords need to make sure that they're handling things correctly when it comes to collecting rent. So we want to go over some key um, aspects for this. Um, so first, landlords need to keep track of what payments are coming in. They should keep a detailed, clear rent ledger. I mean, this, this can be simple though. I mean, it can just be a spreadsheet indicating what's owed each month, what the tenant paid, when they paid, and I'd recommend keeping track of how they paid. That way, if the landlord needs to go back and check their records later, they can see, okay, it was a check or it was a Zelle deposit or what it was, so they can actually go back and find that record. Um, keeping copies of the actual payments themselves is helpful too. Um, to help keep that ledger organized, we generally recommend that landlords do not accept partial payments of rent. So if the rent's $1,000 a month and the tenant you know, has this history of, of not being able to pay on time and say they come in and say, well, you know, landlord, I don't have all the money right now. Let me give you $200 now. I can get you another 200 next week and then I'll pay off the rest later. It's generally best to say, you know what, just, just give me one check for the full amount. Um, and obviously there's situations where that may not be the best course of action, but landlords need to consider that keeping track of the payments coming in and having clear records of what is owed is very, very important. And if they're getting all these partial amounts, it can make things a nightmare for accounting. Uh, the other thing is that if landlords are taking partial amounts, they've got to be careful that the tenant isn't going to be able to claim what that the rest of it was waived. So the landlord um, or the tenant rather may say, well, you told me that 750 was sufficient and that I could forget about the other 250 this month. So if the landlord is going to take a partial payment, there should be something really clear in writing between the landlord and the tenant saying, you know, I got this partial payment from you today, but just a reminder, you owe another $250 still. Um, late fees are another important aspect of rent collection. So we see landlords come in and say, uh, well, the rental agreement allows me to collect a $500 late fee if the tenant's one day late. So I want to collect this late fee from the tenant. Uh, so the rental agreement says that I can do it. And uh, California law says that basically, even if the rental agreement says that, that it may not be lawful. Uh, basically, California law does not allow landlords to collect late fees that are considered a penalty or in legal terms, liquidated damages. Basically, the late fee needs to be... Um, in, in conjunction with whatever sort of damages that the, the landlord's actually suffering. So if because of the late fee, the landlord's late in paying their mortgage and the landlord had to pay a $200 late fee, then maybe charging a $200 late fee is okay. But if the landlord didn't have those sorts of fees or charges that they incurred, then a $200 late fee is probably gonna be unacceptable under California law. Um, and then that can make the accounting that and, and the payments that the landlord has accepted unlawful and just create a nightmare when it comes to rent collection. So this is something that a landlord should work with an attorney to make sure that they're handling that correctly. Um, another really, really important thing is that landlords only accept rent from their actual tenants. So 
and, and Anna kind of already alluded to this, there is one exception for that. But otherwise, you know, say the tenant says, I'm having trouble paying my rent this, this month. Can I have a friend pay? The answer should be no. The, the payment needs to come from the tenant themselves. Otherwise, the landlord may be giving some really, really important rights to these other people, and it can make things a nightmare for the landlord later on. And then finally, landlords need to consider the pros and cons of collecting electronic payments. So we all know that getting payments electronically is convenient, you know, getting a Zelle or a Venmo or just letting the tenant go down and make some deposits into the bank account. It, it, it's just, it's easier for the landlord um, than having to get a rent check and deposit that check, having to wait until the tenant mails it, all that sort of thing. Um, but landlords need to consider that this can have some really important impacts on them if the tenant is just allowed to make deposits at their own will. Um, if the landlord is insisting instead on getting a rent check, they can control who's making deposits into their account. They can control how much is being deposited and when. And so that way they can ensure that they're enforcing these other um, uh, considerations that we've just discussed. And as Anna noted, and perhaps most importantly here, uh, when a landlord is terminating a tenancy, they actually have to stop collecting rent from the tenant. They may waive their whole ability to proceed. Uh, their whole eviction could get kicked out of court, in other words. And if the landlord is, or if the tenant is able to just make these deposits to the landlord, um, the landlord may be losing their rights here. So having the control over how the rent is paid is really, really important. So something that landlords should consider. And then uh, real quick, as I noted, uh, the general rule is you don't wanna take payments from people who are not your tenants, but there is one instance in which California law requires landlords to take payment from third parties. Um, and that is where the third party is signing an acknowledgement saying that they're not currently a tenant of the property and that the landlord's acceptance of their payment is not creating a tenancy with them. And the law luckily has some actual uh, language that the landlord can just use specifically. I've copied it into the slide here. Uh, no need to recreate the wheel. The landlord can just use it exactly like that. Um, but if the landlord is going to take a payment from a third party, then it's really important that they have that third party sign this. And then the landlord actually is obligated to take the payment. All right. And Anna, I'm going to take it away with getting into a tenant's unit. Sounds good. Uh, before I switch gears, I did see a few questions come in on the chat and Olivia and I are going to save about 10 minutes um, at the end of our presentation and answer all of the questions. So we will save time. We will get to your questions. Um, we, I think, are going till about 1.30. So we'll try to wrap up in the next 20 minutes and then uh, get to these questions. OK, so keep them coming in the chat. We'll, we'll monitor them and, and get to them. Uh, realtors' rights to access a tenant-occupied unit. I get asked this question all the time, you know, hey, this tenant isn't being cooperative. I'm trying to get in for a showing or trying to hold an open house. You know, what can we do? What are, what are the rights of the property owner and the agent in this situation? Again, we do have a statute on point. It is California Civil Code Section 1954-1954. It governs when and how and for the reasons um, when an entry into a tenant occupied unit can be done. So again, these slides are more to give kind of a high level overview, but I will hit some of the main questions that I get asked a lot. So again, Civil Code Section 1954, it allows a real estate agent to enter a tenant's unit to show it to prospective or actual purchasers. The main rule is that if the tenant is not present and doesn't consent to the entry, then you have to give a 24 hour written notice 24 hours in advance of the entry. The entry has to be made during normal business hours. There is a California case that came out several years ago um, that says normal business hours can include weekends for the purposes of um, holding open houses or showings for prospective or actual buyers. The um, I get asked this question quite a bit. There's within this statute, there's um, mention of a 120 day notice. And so to make clear what this actually means, um, this is point number four on our slide. An agent or an owner can give a tenant verbal notice of the entry to show the unit to purchasers, but only if that owner or agent 
gave the tenant a written notice of sale within 120 days prior to the verbal notice. So it sounds a little confusing, but what this actually means is if you know, you know, 120 days out that you're going to start marketing the property, having open houses and showings, then you could give a written 24 hour notice um, in compliance with this statute saying the property is going up for sale. We are going to be, um, you know, handling showings and you have to give that 120 days out. I recommend working with an attorney to get that notice drafted so you have a good copy. That way you can give it to the tenants. But I rarely see this done. Um, you know, sometimes owners may not know 120 days out they're going to sell their property or for whatever the reasons are, you don't have 120 days to wait. So I rarely see this used, but it is in the statute. Um, again, it just means that if you give that 120 day notice, then you can give a verbal notice of entry to the tenant. Otherwise, if you don't do it, it's no problem that just give a written 24 hour notice. Okay. Uh, again, I mentioned earlier, um, a 24 hour notice is not required if the tenant is present and consents to the entry. Why or when can uh, the owner enter the tenant's unit? There are very specific reasons listed in the statute. I'm not gonna go through every single one of them, but on the slide, these are the most common um, reasons. So an owner can enter if there's an emergency, um, an owner can enter to make necessary or agreed upon repairs or alterations or improvements. Um, the owner could enter to supply necessary or agreed upon services. And then again, to show the units to prospective or um, actual buyers or contractors or workers. So if an owner needs to show a contractor, you know, hey, I think there's something I want you to look at, an owner can give a 24 hour notice in that situation and enter. Um, or a, a owner could enter pursuant to a court order. So I think the main takeaway from, from this is if you are selling a tenant occupied property and you need to get into that tenant's unit for showings, um, give a 24 hour written notice or talk to the tenant. If, and if they're consenting to the entry, then, then you're okay. Issues do come up when a tenant is co uncooperative or co combative in some situations. Um, I also get questions sometimes about photographing. You know, can you take photos of the tenant's stuff in their unit and put that on your uh, marketing materials? So I get a lot of questions like that. Everything we have to look at, you know, really case by case and fact specific. But my general answer is usually you want to be really careful what you're photographing. You want to tell the tenant in advance. You know, we're having a photographer come out. If you have some something that is um, here that you don't want photographed, please put it away or we'll work with you. But again, you know, these are very um, case and fact specific. So there isn't one kind of answer that fits all. We talk to clients really specifically about the question and, and you know, try to work with them to get. The, the best help they can get. Uh, all right, let's switch gears because we have about 20 minutes and we have a bit more to cover. So Olivia and I will kind of go through the next uh, slides um, you know, pretty quickly so we can get to the meat of some of the things we want to share. And before we move on from the entry into the tenant's unit, just to be clear on what's required for entering, I mean, basically this is a written notice that gets posted on the tenant's door. And it, as Anna noted, it needs to be at least 24 hours in advance. Um, but it, it basically just needs to give the tenant some basics, you know, when, what day and what time is the landlord entering and is anybody else entering with them? So who, um, what purpose are they entering for? And it can just, you know, it can just be one of those reasons that Anna listed. It doesn't have to be super specific, but, you know, I'm entering the unit in order to show it to a potential buyer. Um, and, you know, just this should, these basic things should be clear on the notice. Exactly. Um, okay, so switching gears to repairs. So this is uh, an important landlord obligation. It's important that landlords do it correctly so that they're not, you know, being subjected to liability um, or giving the tenant some excuse for not paying their rent. So there's just a few things that landlords should keep in mind. Um, they should handle and promptly respond to tenant requests. Uh, they should make a written record of efforts to make repairs and keep receipts of the work done. So, for example, uh, you know, actually keep the receipts to show that the work was done in case the tenant later claims it wasn't. And following up and writing with the tenant to confirm when the repair is done is a good idea. Just shoot a quick email. Hey, you know, I'm just confirming I got that plumbing repair done today. 
Um, landlords should always use licensed contractors. So there's no dispute that the, was, that the work wasn't done properly or that it was done unsafely. And we don't really have time to cover it, but landlords should note that there is a statute that says that if the tenant basically goes and complains about the property to the city and a notice of violation is issued, they have to be really careful about continuing to collect rent. They could face really substantial statutory violations if they're collecting rent while that notice of violation is outstanding. So good idea to talk to an attorney if that comes up. Um, again, landlords need to keep in mind that if they're entering a tenant's unit, including to do repairs, they've got to give the tenant written notice unless it's an emergency. You know, if there's like an actual flood or something going on, the landlord may be able to go in. But in all their instances, they need to give the landlord, I'm sorry, the tenant notice before they go in. Um, and some cities also uh, provide for temporary evictions to do uh, certain types of work that's going to make the unit unsafe or unlivable. State law actually provides for a permanent uh, tenant displacement for certain types of evictions relating to this too. We don't have time to go into all of that today, but landlords should just be aware that if they're considering doing repairs on a property that is tenant occupied, uh, there are specific rules they need to follow if the unit is going to be unsafe or unlivable. They should, uh, and it can be really expensive. So talk to, uh, have your clients talk to a landlord attorney before starting in on that, just to know what that might look like, what's it going to cost, all of that sort of thing, and timelines. Okay, and Anna, we can cover our next topic. Great. We're going to switch gears and provide an overview of the California state law that has now been in effect for three years. Um, this is AB 1482, also known as the Tenant Protection Act, um, also known as California Statewide Rent and Eviction Control. So we're gonna go over the two main parts of the law, which is um, the rent control side of things, and then the eviction control side of things, which we mean um, landlords must have a reason to evict tenants if their property falls under this state law. So back in 2019, the legislature passed assembly bill 1482, that's why we call it AB 1482. Um, like I said, it imposes a percentage limit on annual rent increases that a landlord can impose on a tenant, and it requires landlords to have a just cause reason to terminate a tenancy. Um, but this only applies to certain properties, which we will go over. Um, all right. Oh, and there's, um, which Olivia will get into, but under just cause, there are uh, what we call kind of two, two main um, areas. One is what we call fault-based, where the tenant has done something wrong or at fault. And the other is called no fault-based, where the tenant is not at fault, but the property owner wants to recover possession um, for their own use, maybe to sell the property or they want to move in if they're a buyer. So um, again, we'll, we'll go over that in uh, a bit of detail. I'm gonna start out first and talk about the rent control portion. Um, this basically, like I said, uh, this law imposed rent limits on how much property owners can raise the rent each year on their tenants, but the property must be subject to this law in the first place. So which properties are exempt from the rent control limits of AB 1482? First, if the property was built within the past 15 years, it is exempt. And um, the certificate of occupancy is the governing document for, for that date. The, this is a rolling 15 year window. So what that means is every year, new properties are gonna come under this law because it's not just 15 years from 2023, 2024, you have to look back 15 years. So it, it operates on a rolling basis. Properties that are subject to a more restrictive local rent ordinance are also exempt. Classic example are cities like San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, Santa Monica. They have their own rent control ordinance, which means that um, properties in those cities must follow the local ordinance. And usually those are more restrictive or they, they have to be more restrictive. So for example, San Francisco um, has much lower or more restrictive annual allowable limits. And so cities and uh, properties where that are located in San Francisco have to follow that uh, rent control ordinance. Another exemption is if it's a duplex and the owner occupies one of the units 
at the beginning of the tenancy when the tenant moved in and continues to occupy that unit as their principal place of residence. So classic example, two unit building, owner owns the whole building, they live upstairs, tenant lives downstairs. If the owner um, was living there at the time the tenant moved in and continues to live there, then they are also exempt from, that building is also exempt from the rent caps. Um, college dorms are exempt from this. So is um, affordable housing units and project and voucher based sec section eight. So that's government assisted um, rental housing payments. Here's the big exception that um, is most applicable, which is um, single family homes and condos are also exempt, but there are some very specific um, requirements with that. So um, for a single family home or condo to be exempt from rent control under the statewide law, there are several requirements. One, the ownership requirement. The property cannot be owned by an REIT, which is a real estate investment trust. It cannot be owned by a corporation and it cannot be owned by an LLC where there is at least one corporation member. So as long as the property is owned by a person as an individual or a, a, you know, a trust, but not an REIT, then they meet that first prong of the exception. The second prong is that if the owner is claiming this exemption, it must be disclosed in the lease. Most modern leases have a box that you check that says this property is not subject to this law. And as long as that box is checked in that modern lease and the ownership requirements are met, then the property will be exempt from the rent control limits. Um, all right. Oh, and my final two points on the slide here is that uh, this applies for when the tenancy is um, beginning or renewed after July 1st of 2020. That notice has to be in the rental agreement. Here is the exact language um, that must be in that lease. And like I said, most modern leases have this in there, you, but you have to look for it and you have to make sure that box is checked. A few other main points um, about rent control under the state law. Um, what, what is it? How much can you raise the rent by? So annual rent increases are limited to 5% plus the local CPI of the county in which the property is located up to a maximum of 10%. You can only impose two rent increases in a 12 month period, but the combined amount cannot exceed that 5% plus the CPI, again, not to exceed 10%. Um, if you are imposing a rent increase of less than 10%, you must give 30 days written notice. If you are imposing a rent increase of more than 10%, you have to give 90 days written notice. And that's a recent change in the law. It used to be 60 days, now it's 90. You have to add five calendar days if you are mailing that rent increase notice. Um, I see this get messed up quite a bit. Um, sometimes a property owner will email the notice, they'll text it saying, hey, I'm raising your rent. Um, those are both invalid rent increases. And so property owners would not be allowed to collect the rent increase on a text or email notice, or if they haven't given the requisite number of days. So um, yeah, you gotta be really careful and watch out for those little details. Finally, this no rent gouging point, we won't spend too much time on it, but there is a state rule, it's called Penal Code Section 396, and it's an anti-price gouging rule. And it basically means that if there is a declared emergency in the state of California that impacts a county where the property is located, then property owners cannot raise the rent more than 10% during that declared state of emergency. So when we were going through the pandemic with COVID, there was a statewide declaration of emergency recently with fires and flooding. There's been other local emergencies. So property owners have to be aware of this law and they have to make sure that if they're imposing a rent increase of more than 10%, that their property is not located in a county that um, has a, a declaration of emergency in effect. For example, right now, many counties in California have one. San Francisco has one in effect through September 4th of 2023, and that is for the um, flooding that we had back in March. So if a property owner increased the rent right now beyond 10%, um, they could be in violation of Penal Code 396. And just to follow up on that real quick too, I mean, this is important for, you know, if you have clients that are buying a property that has tenants in it, 
uh, it's advisable for that client to have the rent records reviewed either, you know, during, of course, during the course of the sale and afterwards, because the new owner is going to step into the shoes of the former owner. And if the former owner was charging an illegal rent and the new owner keeps charging that rent, they're going to be charging an illegal rent. And so, uh, you know, they can be subjected to liability for collecting an illegal rent amount. So, uh, you know, you want to have your clients make sure they know what they're purchasing and what they're inheriting if they are buying a tenant occupied property and to at least know at the outset if, if this is potentially going to be an issue for them. And if the former owner can't produce records of the rent increases, that should, you know, that, that can be a red flag. So at least something for them to consider as they're thinking about whether or not they should purchase this property. Um, okay, so switching gears here, um, we want to quickly discuss uh, terminating the tenancy because, again, this can be important when you've got clients that want to sell or purchase tenant-occupied properties. Um, we don't have time to get into all the nuances today, but I want to I want to focus on the ones that are probably going to come up for your clients most often. Um, Again, the, the first thing to think about is, is there going to be some limitation on getting the tenants out of the property? And does the landlord need to have a particular reason to get the tenants out of the property? And that is going to mean looking at whether or not AB 1482, this new statewide eviction control uh, law applies, or if there's a local ordinance. We don't have time to get into all the local ordinances today, but we want to focus on some highlights under AB 1482. Um, so the first thing is to find out is, is the tenancy and is the property subject to AB 1482? And first things first, the tenancy only qualifies for these protections if the tenant has lived in the property for a certain amount of time. And basically the tenant has to live, have lived there for at least 12 months before these uh, protections kick in. Um, or at least one tenant has been there for 24 months. On a next slide, please. Um, and Anna actually already covered uh, the exemptions for the types of properties that are exempt from AB 1482. So I'm not going to go through all of those again. Uh, it should be noted that the exemptions for eviction control and the exemptions for rent control are very similar. There's a few small nuances, though. So if you have a client that is considering selling a tenant occupied property, it's a good idea to, to get them connected with a good landlord tenant attorney to find out if these rules apply. Um, so the, the, uh, exemptions are listed on the slide there, so you can read those afterwards. Um, so let's say we assume that the property is not exempt from AB 1482. So these rules apply. What does that mean? That means that the landlord has to have an allowed reason to terminate the tenancy. And these reasons are broken down into what's called fault-based reasons and no fault reasons. So either the tenant did something wrong or they did not do something wrong. Um, and it's important to note that the expiration of the lease term is not a just cause to terminate the tenancy. We get asked this all the time. You know, well, it was a one-year lease. The one year is up. Can I kick the tenant out? If these eviction control rules apply, that is not an allowed reason to terminate the tenancy. You have to have one of the specific reasons that are listed. Um, so we don't have time to go over all the reasons, but it should be noted that, you know, they're, if the tenant's done something wrong, if they're not paying their rent, they're breaking the lease, they're doing something illegal, that can be an, a reason to terminate the tenancy. Um, but what I want to focus on here today are some of the ones that might come up more often uh, for your clients. Um, these are usually what we call the no-fault reasons. So Anna, if you can go ahead and switch slides. And, and these are on the slide. So again, these will be available for you to review afterwards. Um, but a very common one is an owner or a relative move-in eviction. So say somebody is considering purchasing a tenant-occupied property and they want to move in there. Can they do that? Uh, the law says that that can be done if the owner or certain relatives, so a spouse, domestic partner, child, grandchild, parents, or grandparents are going to move into the unit. Um, however, for leases entered into after July 1 of 2020, the lease actually has to allow this reason. Otherwise, it's not allowed. Um, another allowed reason to terminate the tenancy is to withdraw the property from the rental market. And so this is a big one that landlords use when they want to sell a property vacant. And so the key here is that the landlord is pulling the property off the rental market. And this means the whole property. You can't just target one particular unit in the building. If there's multiple units, they've all got to be withdrawn from the market. 
Uh, so this is a big one that landlords use when they want to sell a property vacant. Uh, and then there's also allowed reasons to either conduct certain types of repairs uh, or when a city agency is requiring the property to be vacated. Um, the other thing that landlords need to keep in mind is that if they are going to enact one of these no fault reasons for eviction, they've got to pay the tenant relocation fees. And under the California law, that requires basically giving the relocation fees that are equal to one month of rent. Um, it should be noted, though, that so, you know, in the cities and counties that have their own local ordinances, the relocation fees can be a lot more expensive than that. For example, in San Francisco, it can be tens of thousands of dollars per unit. So um, that's something that landlords should factor in if they're considering selling or if they're considering purchasing a property to move into it, that these relocation fees can be very pricey, um, especially in rent-controlled cities. Um, and then finally, can we go ahead and switch to the next slide, Anna? The other big one, big thing I wanted to talk with you all about is tenant buyouts. So the idea here is that the landlord's not forcing the tenant to move out. They're not serving one of these uh, termination notices. Maybe the landlord doesn't meet the requirements for some reason, say the rental agreement didn't have that owner move-in provision in it, um, or the landlord doesn't want to wait for an eviction process to go forward. Uh, he wants to speed things up. Um, the landlord can consider a tenant buyout. And that's basically the landlord offering the tenant money or something else of value like waived rent in exchange for voluntarily moving out of the property. Uh, an important thing for landlords to note is that some cities have rules that highly regulate these discussion, discussions. Um, for example, San Francisco, Oakland and Berkeley all have rules. We're seeing them pop up more too uh, throughout the state of California. And if these rules are not followed with, it can be really devastating for landlords and they can get sued for some really significant amounts of money. So landlords need to know and talk with a local attorney to find out if these rules apply to them. But the common uh, the commonalities between these laws that we see are that the landlord has to give disclosures to the tenant before starting the buyout discussions. Uh, that if there is an agreement that's reached that is put into writing and it gets recorded with uh, oftentimes with a local rent board and so you know there there can be uh, exceptions or, or rescissions I guess I should say where the tenant can actually change their mind and back out of the agreements so we don't have time to get into all those details but just note that landlords um, should talk with an attorney before they start asking a tenant to move out to see if those rules might apply to them and I've just got some statistics here for San Francisco you can see uh, how uh, how expensive buyouts can be. And it's not this expensive everywhere. Obviously, San Francisco is definitely a unique place because of all the eviction restrictions, but um, landlords sh should, should get legal help in, in doing this, make sure that they are making offers that tenants are going to accept and that they're following the rules so that they don't have costly mistakes that cause them to lose time and, and you know, potentially even get sued for violating the rules that they apply. Right. All right, uh, we have three more substantive slides that we're going to fly through so we can get to answering your questions. Um, the final three topics are um, how to enforce the lease terms, insurance, and certain compliance and fair housing issues. I did see a question really early on pop in about um, you know, tenants moving in. So the compliance and fair housing issues slide should answer that question. All right, but before we get ahead of ourselves, let's talk about enforcing a lease term. So if a tenant is breaching a lease, what are the landlord's options to enforce that lease? Uh, generally, the rule is a landlord can serve a notice to cure that violation of the lease or quit, move out. Um, that's the most commonly used uh, method for landlords to enforce the lease, but there are other less aggressive tactics, um, such as serving a warning notice or a demand letter or a cease and desist type written notice. Uh, some jurisdictions actually require a landlord to give a warning notice before jumping to an eviction notice. So San Francisco is one of them. Um, there is a 10 day warning notice requirement here in the city where if a tenant is violating a provision of their lease, a landlord must give a 10 day warning notice before they can commence legal action. There are some exceptions like if the tenant is causing imminent harm um, and some jurisdictions require the lease violation to actually be substantial. So something like, I, you know, they um, 
uh, put, you know, some kind of different window dressing on the window without my permission, that may not be substantial enough. So we've got to really analyze each situation very specifically. Um, there's a waiver issue. Olivia touched on this a bit earlier regarding um, having anti-waiver language in the lease. But one thing to be mindful of uh, for property owners is if you are aware that your tenant is breaching a term of the lease and you continue to accept rent from that tenant knowing of the breach, there could be a potential waiver argument that you have now waived that tenant's bad conduct. So you should talk to a lawyer to see how to figure that out and to resolve that. Um, all right, we'll touch on insurance briefly before moving on to compliance and fair housing issues and then getting to the questions. Yeah, so, um, We've talked about all the rules, well, not all the rules, but we've talked about a lot of rules that landlords need to follow and suffice it to say that there's a bunch more too uh, that apply throughout the state and, and locally. Um, so landlords have to be careful, right? Um, and sometimes people make mistakes. Sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes people get hurt. Um, and insurance comes into play here. Um, it's, and it's really, really important that landlords have the right rental policy in place before something goes wrong. Um, so minimally, this means ensuring that the landlord has an actual landlord tenant rental policy in place, not just a homeowner's policy, uh, that the, the policy is clear that it, there are tenants occupying the property, and that it includes coverage for wrongful eviction and personal injury. So if a landlord talks with their agent, those are kind of the key things they want to make sure with their agent that is included in the policy. Um, it's also really important that they make sure that the details listed on the policy are correct. For example, that their names are listed on there correctly and that it matches the deed. That sounds really obvious, but you'd be surprised how often I see landlords that don't have that set up right. You know, they have maybe, maybe they own the property in a family trust, but their names are only listed there as an individual uh, or the property address isn't listed correctly. Maybe it leaves off some units. And we've seen an increase in insurance companies recently actually denying clients for coverage because of these sorts of things. These claims can get really, really expensive to defend. And I think the insurance companies are frankly looking for ways to get out of coverage um, to protect their bottom lines. And so if, if the insurance policy is not set up correctly, there may not be coverage later. So it's really important to check for those details. Um, and the other thing, too, is that we've seen an increase in landlords coming to us lately and saying, well, my insurance agent says I can't get that wrongful eviction coverage. So sorry, I, you know, I don't have it. And that is true. The, a lot of um, companies are um, scaling back on the policies that they're writing that include these extra coverages, but there are still companies out there that offer them. And we're encouraging clients to keep shopping around. If you get a, a no as an answer the first time, keep looking because not having that coverage in place can be absolutely devastating for a landlord. I mean, we're talking about, you know, if something goes wrong, we certainly hope it doesn't, but if it does, you know, it's life and things happen. Um, landlords can be facing claims for upwards of six figures. I mean, we even see claims some, some days in, in the seven figures. I mean, and this can completely wipe out someone. So having that insurance policy in place is just, it, it's, one of the most important things that a landlord can do. Yeah, it's critical. It's a good reminder to check your property insurance policies. Yeah. Yep. And even if you're a homeowner, <laughs> check and make sure your address is listed on there correctly, your name's on there correctly. You never know. Mm -hmm. All right. Finally, fair housing issues. Um, I wanted to tell everyone in our final minute about some influx of um, discrimination cases we're seeing come in quite a bit that we are defending. So I wanted to put this on people's radars. So important to know, uh, California has very strict anti-discrimination housing policies. Um, some high level points on this slide. If you are offering an accommodation, you have to do so on an equal basis. Um, you cannot discriminate against applicants for your rental housing units based on categories of protected classes, um, including you know, age, race, religion. There are many, many protected classes. One of them, which people don't always know about, is uh, what we call source of income. What does that mean? Well, it means that if a tenant um, emails you and says, hey, I saw you're posting for a rental housing unit. I have a Section 8 housing voucher. Do you accept that voucher? 
if the landlord says no, that landlord can get into some pretty hot water. Those are the discrimination um, cases that we are seeing because it is unlawful to discriminate on the tenant's source of that income. So watch out for that. If you are advertising or your property manager is advertising your rental housing unit, you must always answer that question with yes, everyone is welcome to apply. Okay, um, watch out for service animals too. Some uh, landlords may have a no pets policy, but if the tenant says I have an emotional support animal or I have um, a service animal, you cannot deny that tenant the right to potentially rent that housing because of that. Um, there are other protected classes like military status. Um, there are also many, many rules and regulations for what must be in posting and rental advertisements. So uh, you have, we definitely don't have time to get into all those rules, but be aware that there are um, rules about this. And you also have to use caution and care when screening potential um, applicants and what questions you are asking to avoid discrimination claims. You cannot ask things like, do you have children? Or are you married? Or what language do you speak? Because those can potentially trigger um, discriminatory uh, claims by, by the tenants. Yeah, and I saw a question come in too. The question was about um, what to consider for, uh, if they, I think it says, what to consider for out of country tenant moving in for the first time. So it basically, as Anna noted, one of the protected classes is nationality. Um, and this can also come up in, in having, when tenants are applying. So for example, if you're asking the person, the prospective tenant to provide a social security number, but they don't have one, that can actually inadvertently create some sort of housing discrimination claim. Because if you say, well, sorry, you can't apply if you don't have a social security number, you may be accidentally discriminating against someone because of nationality, because they don't have that. So landlords need to be really careful and have other ways of validating who a person is and checking identity. Um, that's not just asking for a social security number and having some alternative way of doing that if they don't have one. Exactly. Um, so yeah, that answered that first question. We'll dive into the others. Just a quick note that um, the laws are always changing. So things that we've shared today could be different <laughs> months or days or years from now. So you do want to make sure if you are um, experiencing an issue or your client is, connect them with an attorney who handles this area. Um, and again, the purpose of today is to provide all of this general information. It's not meant to convey legal advice. So with that being said, let's dive into some of the questions. Um, Olivia did answer the first one. Uh, the next question that came in is, if the tenant gives notice and moves out two weeks later, when does the 21 days begin? That's in the context of returning the security deposit. The 21 days is triggered from the move out date. So not from the date they give notice, but the date the tenant actually moves out. And the next question I see is, it says, if a late fee needs to cover damages to the landlord, how do you get the tenant to pay their rent on time? So this was the whole issue with late fees and that penalty that you can't charge late fees as a penalty. Um, it, there's other ways to get tenants to pay their rent on time. For example, if they haven't paid, the tenant can be served a three-day notice to pay or quit, and they can actually they're risking getting their tenancy terminated. So, if a tenant is late, the landlord should follow up and remind the tenant to make a payment. And if they still don't make the payment, then the landlord should talk with an attorney. But that could minimally include serving a three-day notice to pay or quit and starting legal proceedings to terminate the tenancy if the tenant is not paying. The next one is what is lawful notice? That question came in in the context of the um, right of access to a tenant's unit. Olivia did answer that live. Um, the quick summary is the notice must include the date, time, purpose of entry, who is in, um, entering the unit, and it must be served properly. So either personally handed to the tenant 24 hours in advance or posted on the tenant's door. And it can also be mailed, but if it's mailed, it has to be six days in advance. So a lot of time people don't know that it, you know, there's not enough time to do that. So posting would be preferred over mailing if there's not enough time. Yes, and that answers that next question, um, posting on the door preferred. Also, a lot of um, our clients will sometimes text message or email uh, notice, and under the law, that's not technically a valid form of service, but if the tenant responds back with the text or email saying, yes, no problem, come on in, then that is okay. Do the landlord required to have a fire extinguisher? I had to recently look this up. Someone else asked me this. Um, the California Fire Code <laughs> 
requires um, businesses to have a fire extinguisher on a business premises, but it doesn't say, or at least not that I've seen, that it has to be in a rental unit. So that is the difference that I've seen. It's probably a good idea to have one because if there is an emergency, um, there, there is one on site, but landlords are considered a business and businesses are supposed to have a fire extinguisher on the premises under the California Fire Code. Uh, this person follows up saying um, the, their property management company said it's a policy for them to have that. I don't think that's a bad idea. Is selling a just cause? Olivia, you want to jump in on that one? Yeah, and there's a related question too, is selling the property to the same as withdrawing it from the market. So I think we kind of touched on this during the presentation, but that selling to have a vacant property usually means we're going to use that withdrawing the property from the rental market. Um, so the California law does not have specifics in it, which is kind of interesting. There's actually some proposed legislation to tighten this up too, but we see in local laws that have a similar allowed just cause reason. Um, and you may have heard of the Ellis Act before. This is this state, another state law um, rule on withdrawing the property from the rental market when there's local restrictions on evictions. Um, the, the local rules put uh, really specific restrictions on when the property can be re-rented again after it's been withdrawn from the property, I'm sorry, withdrawn from the market under that allowed just cause reason. The state law, um, AB 1482 eviction, doesn't have that same language in there, but what we're generally telling clients is that if you're invoking the withdrawing the property from the rental market uh, allowed reason to terminate a tenancy, you better not be renting the property anywhere in the near future. I mean, I would say at least years late, you know, until at least years later. Um, so if you're selling the property, that shouldn't be a big problem. I mean, you, you're selling the property, you terminate to withdraw the property from the rental market, and then you go ahead and you sell it. So you, you haven't re-rented and you should be fine. Um, I do think that there's a question as to whether or not there's restrictions on a new owner. And again, local rules that have um, similar just cause reasons almost always attach the re-rental restrictions to new owners. So for example, in San Francisco, uh, if you invoke the Ellis Act, withdraw the property from the rental market, a new owner could not re-rent the property for years to come either. Um, again, the state law is not as specific on it, but I think we're going to see in the coming years that they're going to tighten that up and, and apply similar restrictions. Uh, jumping around a bit, I think a related question came in. Um, I thought that there was a 60-day notice required if the property is sold. If you are selling the property and you're invoking the withdrawing of the rental unit from the market under state law and the tenant has lived there more than a year, then you have to give a 60-day notice. Okay, jumping around a bit. Um, these couple of questions are related to the deposit. So if a landlord and tenant um, are breaking their lease, can the landlord hold the deposit? And can the landlord hold the deposit if the tenant is not given their 30 day notice? Um, we have to look at the lease first to see what the lease says regarding termina early termination of the lease. But um, generally, if the landlord is trying to apply that security deposit as damages, um, again, have to look at the governing lease, have to look at uh, state law section 1950.5 to see whether you can apply that lease to unpaid rent, uh, that deposit to unpaid rent. Um, there's a lot more detail we could get into, but in the interest of time, I know we're a bit over, so um, I won't really dive into all of the, the details on that, but short answer is we've got to look at the lease and the statute to see what the, link, the landlord's rights are. Each lease is different. Um, Final couple of questions. I think these came up in the context of the buyout slide. Are limits figures based on bedrooms and what can you use to evaluate tenants? Um, Olivia, I guess my answer for the limit figures based on bedrooms, if um, the question is regarding how much to pay a tenant in a buyout, um, that's what I'm interpreting it. If I'm wrong, shoot us an email and we'll be happy to chat. But um, buyouts are completely negotiable. There, some cities have limits, like you can't offer less than the relocation money. That's an Oakland rule. But other cities, there are no um, such requirements. So you can negotiate um, the, the amount in a buyout. Yeah, and I'm not sure what the, what the question asking about evaluating tenants is talking about have perspective tenants. So when you're considering renting to a new tenant, <clears throat> um, I mean, we could basically California has very specific rules again on this topic as well. Uh, we could give an entire presentation just on that topic alone. So we don't have time to get into all the nuances there, but 
what I do want to emphasize is that it's really important that landlords uh, get some help from an attorney before they start that process and just at least set up some guidelines on you know what's okay to ask and what's not okay to ask. You'd be surprised by how many sorts of questions are not okay to ask prospective tenants, even asking about a tenant's criminal background, for example. That one would seem like fair game, but it's not necessarily. So um, we'd, we'd recommend that uh, landlords set up in a, a consultation with uh, an attorney and just set up some parameters on like what's okay to ask and what's not. All right. Yeah, the uh, topic of how to screen tenants and what we can do to screen tenants is probably another. Uh, let me know when you're ready. All right. <laughs> exactly. The whole other course. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we use rent spree and, you know, I get a lot of, we do a lot of rentals. So that would be a good topic in the future. So um, if you if you have any more questions, uh, too bad because we've been out of time. <laughs> Um, contact information has been shared. There's a copy of the handouts. This will be on my YouTube channel within a reasonable period of time. And I want to thank Olivia and Anna for uh, spending some time today to make us wiser real estate agents. Thank you so much for having us. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Pleasure seeing you all again. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.